the grain as that way and become an oval section, which is absolutely critical to the next day. And then we'll leave that there overnight tonight and see what they're like in the morning. It's shrunk twice as much that way as that way. Brilliant. So we're now going to put the squeeze of these into the wet holes here. That grain direction there yep. has to go across the joint that way. Okay. Not like that. No. Like that. And it'll make a slightly alarming creaking noise. As they dry, the holes will shrink, locking tight around the oval rungs and fixing the joint firmly together. Just try and pull that out. There's no glue, no That's nothing. Amazing. You will not be able to get that out. And as that shrinks, it gets tighter as well. Put it over there. Guy's method for testing the strength of the chair frame joints is not for the faint-hearted. Wow. Yay. That's strong enough? Yeah. Right, let's put the rest of it together. Come on. The end's in sight now, and there's just one more job to do, which is to drill the remaining mortises. This is kind of critical we get this part right, because it kind of ruins everything if we don't. I think we're quite anxious, mostly because Guy looks really nervous. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's kind of set us off a bit. That is way out, so don't ask me what's happened. Oh, that's a shame. I'm going to burst into tears. <laughs> it's one of those things about the craft, having to focus every single moment, and that this is one of those big moments they've got to get right. Despite their various setbacks, after eight days of painstaking work, all of the pieces finally come together. You've made a stool. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> we made a stool. No, no, you made a stool. <laughs> I just you. showed you how. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Well done, Tom. Well done, Tom. There's not one fixing in there that I'm used to using, like glue or screws or anything. It's just all on understanding the characteristics of the material, and it's a pretty satisfying experience, I must say. Whilst the trainees continue to hone their new skills in Dorset, I'm off to Wales and the Pembrokeshire coast to look at a completely different use for Greenwood. When you're in the middle of a wood, you can get the sense of being deeply landlocked. But, of course, this is a tiny island, and from very earliest times, the easiest way to move around it was by boat. And right up until the 19th century, all our boats, from the great naval fleets that defeated the Armada and Nelson's fleet, to the humblest craft, were made always of green wood. I've come here to meet Terry Kenny, who practices the ancient craft of coracle making. Nice to meet you. Hello there. Hi. What's this? Uh, this is the framework of an iron bridge coracle. And the framework is completed. I'm just sawing off the surplus and then it will be covered with calico and painted it, with bitumastic paint. It's extraordinarily simple, isn't it? I it mean, is. It's a basic boat, yeah. Were they always made from greenwood? Yes, always made from greenwood. Uh, usually willow, but in later times it became uh, ash. So, when it's green like this, I mean, these are very, very flimsy strips, but very bendable, I guess. Yes, that's right. You, you need the flexibility, obviously, to, to get the curves and to, to put the framework together. Yeah. But the fact that they're interwoven, that they lock together... Yeah, I mean, this, this is strength. rigid. That's, that's yes. strong. Yes. I mean, what did they use them for? All sorts of things. The, the Welsh coracles became kind of specialised as inland fishing boats. Yeah. The Ironbridge type were much more of a general-purpose boat. Uh, used a lot for just crossing the river mm. to avoid paying the toll on the Iron Bridge and for setting night lines for eels and so forth. So this was a, a poor man's craft? Oh, very much so. The old fellow down at Iron Bridge used to say, if you saw a man carrying a coracle, it's not worth mugging him. He's got no pennies on him. Right, so he's got no... He's got a poor man's boat. I wasn't going to come all this way without having a go. And the beauty of these boats is you can just pick them up and sling them over your shoulder. These are amazingly light. When you think that it's a boat, I could go off poaching, avoiding my tolls, fishing. Yes. Walking with them is the easy bit, but getting into them without any in the water is much harder. For your first attempt, it's a good idea for somebody to hold it while you get in. Okay. Get your weight into the middle as soon as you can. OK, I'm in the middle. OK, okay. okay. you feel comfortable? Yeah. That's it. You have a very, very basic craft made out of 
probably the most ancient of all skills, which is green woodwork. Yes. But it does the job, it's but exactly, not a lot yes, more. Yes. Well, if you define a boat as something that keeps you afloat, it does the job, yeah. doesn't it? And, and gets you from A to B. Yeah. Albeit in a very circular way. Gentle way, yes. What I really like about this is the illustration that Greenwood crafts weren't just the province of the lone woodman working for years to master this arcane series of skills, but very practical, applying to a huge range and diversity of people for an equally vast range of applications. And in the end, it was about tools. Making something that did the job. Making it from available materials and making it cheap. Back in Dorset, the group are now nearly four weeks into their training. And they're about to have a taste of commercial Greenwood reality. Skittles is very popular in many West Country pubs, and Guy has been given a commission to make a new set of Skittles by his local. So he's decided to use the job as an exercise to see how the trainees cope with the pressure of working with clients to a strict specification and deadline. Balls can travel at anything up to 45 miles an hour, and they shatter and break. Dimensions need to be very similar, and they must be capable of standing up vertically from either end. Quite heavy work turning something like this, isn't it? I think it's to... going to be hard work, but I think we can do it. On this task, they'll be working as a team with Guy to produce okay, nine no, no, skittles, like and he's giving them a deadline of just two days to complete the whole set. But even the initial cleaving is presenting some problems. It's too heavy. You're so, sorry, you've gone back. Right, look, look what you're doing. I'll show you what you're doing, and then you might see. You're doing this. I can't, no, it's right, too heavy, this. I can't listen, do anything listen, else because Charles just told me to right, do something. Hold it like that, hold it tight and you're, I, like, you're not doing it in your wrist. Well, doing it's, I, 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 I can physically un... can't do it like that. This will be the largest block of wood they'll ever have to work with and it will be really hard work. I think they're going to be very, very tired at the end of today. They've got a lot to do and a lot of it's very physical. One telegraph pole. I kind of get the feeling that they've got quite high standards. I don't think they're going to beat around the bush if they're not up to scratch. And they all have to match. And odds on, if one doesn't match, it's going to be mine, isn't it? It's, it's just a job just to, to get it on the lathe and even start turning a cylinder, let alone shaping it into a skittle shape. I'm beginning to uh, recognise the advantages of the advent of the Industrial Revolution, quite <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Bring on power. All you have to do... Let's make it like that. Great. We've roughed out nine. Guy's finished one, and Tom has. Tom's further ahead than I am. It's been a long day, and I'm tired, and I want to go home, and I want to have a bath. Sarah is finding the sheer physical demands of the job completely overwhelming. It's really tough. I came in this morning, and I was being really positive. Yeah, it's a team project, and you know, build up the team, and I can't do it. Okay, Guy calls it a day and sends them all home to rest and recharge. Morning. Hi, Guy. We really do need to finish these today. Just one skittle was completed yesterday, and they'll need to speed up dramatically if they're to have any chance of hitting that target. One down? Just a few to go. <laughs> It's really nice to see everyone working together, churning them out. And as the light fades on the second day, they've all risen to the challenge. Well done for roughing this out, Sarah. Thank you. Guys, you want to bring yours over? And yes. see what we've got. Sarah still needs to be cut. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And any, any others half there's produced? One on the so eight. So there's only one more to go. After that's finished, that's great. Well done considering what incredibly hard work it was and how technically difficult it is to get the, the finish on that. And I think you've done really well, but I think we should pack it in because everyone's knackered again. <laughs> well done, see you tomorrow. See you bright and breezy. Bye. The exhausted trainees head home, whilst Guy remains behind to finish the last skittle.
The next evening, they deliver the order to their clients. Cool. They are indeed looking very good. I see you've made quite a fair fist of cutting them off square. They're standing very yeah. well. They do look excellent. They do look really, really good. So far, so good. But will they perform as well as they look? Hold it together, sir. Go on. Focus. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Our trainees have had four weeks now to learn the basic skills of green woodworking. Now they've got ten days to put all that together in a piece that they design and make themselves. The best one will have a chance to exhibit it here at Ford Abbey for a year. 50,000 people pass through here and they are all exactly the market that they're aiming at. So far, we've been in the, in the teaching workshop, but in true style of bodgers working in the woods, um, we think it's about time that we got you working in your own shelters in the woods. The point of this exercise is to build a contemporary version of a bodger's shelter. We're trying to separate them so they get that feeling of being on their own in the woods, um, which will be a big change for them after this sort of group dynamic they've had. And it'll enable them to focus, hopefully, much more on their particular work. Got it. We like this. That's great. It's a great design and very, very simple. So it's time for your final project now. You've got to design and make your own chair. So good luck, work hard, and uh, I hope you're going to make me proud of you. Having established their own individual camps, or bodger's hovels, the three are going to select a tree to cut down to provide the wood for their chairs. Today we're going to the woods to select a tree, or a couple of trees, and what really excites me is that we're meeting a man who's bringing a horse to pull the wood out. And that is something I want to see. We're meeting up with Mace Brightwater, who uses traditional methods to manage the woodland at Ford Abbey. See, that's yeah. a lovely... That, how about that for straight ash there? That's lovely. Not I mean, it's, yeah, it's quite a tall tree, though, isn't it? Let me just have a look around the other side. Taking a tree is no small undertaking. Yeah. So you use it efficiently and you give some yeah. respect yeah. back yeah. to the planet. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. part of something I believe in religiously. So this is quite a luxury, this process. Have you found the tree you want? Yeah, but this is lovely and straight. <laughs> this is the one for me, anyway. I think put that to Mace and see if he'll Definitely fit it. Definitely that one. I'm looking at that thinking, is it possibly a bit big for your purpose? This is probably my first consideration, but it does seem to have quite a nice straight form, evenly balanced canopy, so nothing too unusual going on there. As good as any. Let's do it. <laughs> Then the horse comes in and effortlessly draws the tree trunk away, barely leaving a hoof print in its wake. A thought that I've had today, and particularly seeing the tree come down, is that our lives are so divorced from the source of things. You know, even if we do DIY and make it, we receive it in neatly prepared boards from a store. And actually to see a tree come down, and then from that tree you make the finished object reinforces the importance of the connection of, of a piece of furniture, or even a spoon, to a growing tree. Back at the camp, Tom has wasted no time in deciding what type of chair he wants to make, and quickly knocks up a prototype. Well, it kind of rocks. Meanwhile, Sarah has decided to bypass some of the more challenging Greenwood skills, to make what's known as stick furniture. Lots of people in the Greenwood work, work world um, slightly look down upon stick furniture as, as a less skilled um, version of, of Greenwood work. And frankly, compared with the chair that we've made as the project and the stool we made, it's